Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Horseshoe Crab Board meeting. Um, I've been instructed by Bob and Tony that I have to get us back on schedule or I'm not getting paid, so we got to really be efficient in our deliberations today. Uh, my name is Jim Gilmer. I'm the Administrative Commissioner from New York, and I'll be chairing the meeting today. Um, just a couple of introductions before we go. Um, we've got, uh, obviously, Kirby Roots Murdy, who everyone knows for, from the Commission staff, is doing a fine job running this whole thing. Uh, Jim Lyons, who doesn't have a name tag today, is going to be doing presentations. we got Steve Doctor from the Technical Committee. And we've got Jim, Co uh, Jim Cooper, who's on the uh, advisory panel. So uh, with that, we'll just get right into the agenda. First order of business is uh, uh, approval of the agenda. It should be in your briefing materials. Any, are there any changes to the uh, agenda? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll adopt those by consensus. Second, we have approval of the proceedings from the May 2016 meeting. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In reviewing the proceedings, I just noted that uh, Mr. Chris Batsavage's name is noted throughout the meeting, and he actually was not here that day. I was here that day representing North Carolina, so perhaps there was another Chris around the table who might have been speaking that day. I believe that was from the federal government, so we apologize for that, and your uh we would never miss you, mistake you for Chris Pat Savage, Michelle. Thanks a lot. We'll make that change. Any other changes to the to the meeting minutes? Okay, we'll take those as adopted. No public comments on items outside of the right. agenda. Right. Uh, next uh, agenda items is for public comment. Before every meeting, we have a, a period for public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, I know there's a bunch of people who would like to talk later on when we get into motions, but this is just a time for. Uh, issues not on the agenda. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to our next item. And our first uh, business item is going to be a review and consideration uh, recommendation from the Adaptive Resource Management Subcommittee and revisions to the ARM framework. And we're going to have a presentation from Jim Lyons. Jim? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Lyons. I'm with USGS Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, and I am the chairman of the Adaptive Resource Management Subcommittee, and I'm here to provide um, some recommendations from uh, recent work reviewing the ARM framework uh, of the subcommittee. I uh, will start with a little bit of background about the ARM framework and um, how we got here. We, uh, the ARM framework was established by Addendum 7, and uh, as far as I know, it was the first of its kind in a multi-species management approach, especially between a fishery and a bird conservation, but we have a multi-species approach to predict the optimal strategy for horseshoe crab harvest. The two main monitoring programs in this framework are the um, Virginia Tech Trawl Survey for the horseshoe crab population monitoring and a mark resite approach to monitoring the uh, stopover population of red knots. The entire adaptive management framework, um, like all adaptive management frameworks, is a two-phase approach where you have an initial setup phase where you identify the objectives of, of uh, this decision, the options that are available to you, some models, some population models, in this case of system dynamics and the monitoring that you need to make uh, good decisions. Once you have the setup phase complete, you can enter this iterative phase where you regularly make decisions, in this case an annual decision about the harvest, uh, the harvest decision. So it's also customary in adaptive management frameworks to periodically revisit the setup phase and uh, review those aspects of your decision framework that I just mentioned, the objectives and your options and your models and your monitoring, and see if you have those, um, if you have those aspects specified correctly and if you require any changes. And so that is what our recent work has been about, is revisiting the setup phase and reviewing some of these aspects of the decision-making framework. In recent years, um, the harvest recommendations have been 500,000 um, crabs, males only, um, and uh, 
we, I want to point out a couple of aspects of the mortality estimates in the horseshoe crab population dynamics model that will help us understand some of the options uh, that I'm going to present. In the population dynamics model, we have two sources of mortality. There's a natural mortality process and then um, the harvest recommendation, the mortality associated with that harvest recommendation is subtracted. Uh, from the crabs that have survived natural mortality. So in this process of projecting the population, we have a natural uh, mortality process, and then we subtract whatever the recommendation is. So it will be helpful to keep those two sources of mortality in mind. Uh, in the fall of 2015, uh, the TCs and the ARM subcommittee uh, recommended revisiting the uh, setup phase. And in... Uh, February of 2016, this ARM subcommittee presented five potential review items to the board. Some of them were considered short-term review items that could be completed in six to eight months. Some of them were longer-term things that would require one to two years to complete. And at the February meeting, the board tasked our subcommittee with uh, completing the three short-term review items. And those are listed here at the bottom of this slide. We want to and the things I'm going to report on today. We're going to talk about the monitoring program and our evaluation of the current monitoring. That is, is our monitoring effective and accurate? Uh, do we have the right data involved? Are we using the best available data? And can we make some improvements to the monitoring program? We're also going to talk about the harvest packages and a review of those packages and uh, do we have them specified correctly? Are there new options we would like to consider or more options we would like to consider? Uh, and then finally, we have this objective function, which has several parts, and uh, we evaluated different parts of the objective function uh, to see if it was specifying our objectives correctly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to report on, on those three aspects of the ARM framework. The first, um, the first aspect, or the first short-term review item is evaluating the monitoring programs that we have. And the first aspect of that is um, an evaluation of the Virginia Tech uh, trial survey. The adaptive management framework was designed essentially around the Virginia Tech trial survey. It's the most direct monitoring of the Delaware Bay horseshoe crab population um, and is uh, the most appropriate monitoring of the horseshoe crab population for this decision-making framework. Uh, however, funding for the trial survey, as you know, has um, has been inconsistent and has lapsed in some years. But given our review of uh, the benefits of the Virginia Tech trial survey, our recommendation is to continue this, bottom, this Virginia Tech trial survey in future years since it supports the adaptive resource management model and provides substantial and important data for this assessment. Additionally, we also recommend or support the recommendations to estimate the proportion of the Delaware Bay population that's available in time and space in this monitoring and also assess the selectivity of gear used in the survey. These are two aspects of the um, Virginia Tech trawl survey that could be these two assessments might be improvements to this monitoring program and would be therefore uh, improvements to the ARM framework and so we support that. The second aspect of the monitoring review was to evaluate abundance indices from other surveys. And you can see four surveys listed here that in the years when the Virginia Tech trial survey wasn't available, we uh, developed a composite index using all four of these surveys and correlating these surveys with the Virginia Tech trial survey. Uh, and es essentially to predict what the Virginia Tech trial survey would um, would estimate if it, if it had been run. And uh, there was fairly good correspondence between this composite index based on these other surveys and uh, the Virginia Tech trial survey. And so um, in some ways this was an effective workaround when the Virginia Tech trial survey was not available. And so our re recommendation is that if the Virginia Tech trial survey is not funded, uh, a practical alternative is to continue to use this composite index of abundance based on data from these other surveys, uh, although it is somewhat of an ad hoc approach and an indirect uh, monitoring of the Delaware Bay population. 
The third aspect of the monitoring review is to uh, evaluate mark recapture approaches to estimating the horseshoe crab population. And there have been two uh, mark recapture studies um, in evaluating or trying to develop ways to use mark recapture to monitor horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay. That is Smith et al. in 2006 and Merritt in 2015. Uh, and both of these studies were considered um, maybe partly successful um, because of the large amount of tagging that seems to be required for mark recapture approaches to be a viable way to monitor horse the horseshoe crab population around the Delaware Bay region. And so while there's some potential uh, for these kinds of approaches, there's more work to be done here before this is um, ready for, for management decision making. So our recommendation at this time is that mark recapture is not a viable option for estimating the horseshoe crab abundance within the ARM framework and therefore it should not be incorporated into the model but uh, should be continue to be developed uh, for future consideration. The fourth uh, aspect of the monitoring review was to look at the Red Knot Population Monitoring Program. And this evaluation essentially consisted of um, developing or uh, documenting the study design and a mark recite sampling plan uh, for this mark recite estimation. That is essentially how do we go around to all the beaches around the Delaware Bay and collect this mark reciting data in an effective way. Um, we did not develop any new protocols, but um, implemented, we, we, we took this documentation of the study design and the sampling plan and we met with the shorebird monitoring teams from Delaware and New Jersey and um, renewed our efforts to collect the data in a way that's consistent with the model. Uh, the mark reside estimates are always um, larger than estimates that come from the aerial surveys that are conducted and there is some disagreement about among the subcommittee members of the source of that of these discrepancies um, and uh, those those things are uh, described in the report that we provided. So our recommendation uh, is to continue the Mark Recite data collection program with renewed effort to collect the data according to the sampling plan and in a way that's consistent with the modeling that's done. Our final aspect of evaluating the monitoring program was to evaluate incorporation of biomedical data into the, into the ARM framework. Um, as you know, the biomedical data and biomedical mortality was not previously included in the ARM framework. But current estimates suggest that biomedical mortality is 8 to 12 uh, percent of coastwide mortality. And so it would be an improvement in the ARM framework if we can include this known source of mortality in the decision making process. Given the consideration of the biomedical data um, and maintaining confidentiality but using that data as part of the stock assessment, uh, we also evaluated the potential to include biomedical data in the ARM framework. And so we developed and evaluated five different options or five different ways that we could uh, evaluate that, evaluate that use of biomedical data. And so our first um, general recommendation is, uh, the, and the subcommittee was in large and strong agreement about this, is that biomedical mortality should be accounted for in the ARM framework. We did come to a consensus uh, option, but I'm going to present uh, today a majority option and a minority option uh, for your consideration. So this is a description of the majority option, which is adjust the harvest packages to account for biomedical mortality of females. Uh, the harvest packages would be adjusted for mortality, but the subcommittee understands the importance of maintaining confidentiality and also the importance of not placing a cap on biomedical mortality. So what this option does with this change to the packages does create an allocation decision for the board between the biomedical mortality and the bait harvest. In this option, this majority option, the packages would be changed every four to six years. And at that time, we would calculate a running average, uh, a three to five year average, a recent year average of the biomedical mortality and, and adjust the packages to reflect this uh, biomedical mortality. 
And so we created an example here in the table with the current ha harvest packages on the left-hand side of this table. Um, and you see the five packages there. And those are the packages that we have been using uh, since the framework was adopted. On the right-hand side of the table to the right of the dark, heavy line, we see an example um, that was created using recent data. And it would show the total harvest under this example for the majority option. And I've put them there close to each other so that you can see, and I would like to emphasize, the minimal amount of change that is occurring with the packages uh, given, given this option. The biomedical mortality for females is, ooh, is included, and um, the packages change in a small way. To the right of the total harvest uh, columns, we, for the example, we see uh, the biomedical data. This, these are example numbers that come from recent data. Uh, but these are, this is an example of the uh, amount of biomedical mortality and how those numbers are added to create the new packages. And then finally, on the right-hand side of this table, we see the example bait harvest that would result. And um, under this option, if biomedical uh, mortality increases over time and horseshoe crab populations do not increase, then, bio, then bait uh, harvest does decline. But this is the preferred option because, um, first of all, it maintains confidentiality. The way that the biomedical data are used would maintain confidentiality of that information. Um, it is, does not place a cap on biomedical mortality. Um, it minimizes the changes to the packages. The new options would, the new packages would be fairly similar to the current packages. And then finally, it's the most transparent option. That is, uh, the harvest packages are an accessible, visible part of the ARM framework, and it is very explicit and transparent here how the biomedical data would be incorporated. The minority option uh, is to account for biomedical harvest in the population dynamics equations only of the ARM framework. So under this option, we do not create any new packages or change any allocation. We continue with the same current packages, but we incorporate the biomedical mortality into the population dynamics equation. That is, we do similar calculations um, periodically to estimate the a running average of the biomedical mortality. And in our population projections and making these decisions, uh, we subtract not only the current package's mortality, but also the biomedical uh, after natural mortality. So the, the total harvest under this option is actually greater than the majority option. So there's uh, one issue that the subcommittee would like to point out is that the mortality associated with blood cl crabs is variable and not fixed, um, but we could potentially update this value every four to six years. Um, the other thing that I would, uh, should point out is that because of the way uh, biomedical mortality would be added to the current harvest packages, the total overall harvest is actually greater under this option, and there is the potential that this option could lead to more conservative uh, harvest recommendations in the future if uh, populations don't increase. That concludes the short, first short-term uh, monitoring re review item. The second review item was to evaluate alternative harvest packages. Uh, and in recent years, package three has been selected um, consistently, uh, 500,000 crab, male crabs and no female crabs. And in considering the potential to add new packages um, or add more packages or create new packages, we evaluated several alternatives, but the subcommittee uh, is, is came to the conclusion that uh, 
adding new packages is not likely to change any recommendations because of the way uh, there are utility thresholds for the horseshoe crab population and the red knot population. While we are below those abundance thresholds, uh, the recommendations are unlikely to change no matter how many packages you have available. They're still unlikely to be picked. And so our recommendation is uh, that we do not recommend adding new harvest packages to the ARM framework as part of this review item, although the packages should be altered to uh, address biomedical harvest. And our third short-term review item is to uh, evaluate the objective function here, and there are four aspects of this. The first one was to, the suggestion was made that we should change the order of red knots and horseshoe crabs in this objective function. And you can see the objective function here in the box. This is how it's stated, where essentially it's the, the, the objective statement says to maximize the harvest of horseshoe crabs while being constrained by red knot populations. And that's how we achieve these, these two objectives. There was a suggestion that we should re reverse these two things and have the objective be maximize red knot recovery constrained by having a horseshoe crab harvest. But it's clearly not, this is clearly not a decision framework or an approach to decision making that ASMFC is, um, is the decision maker, and so this is really not an appropriate change for us. Our recommendation that is changing the order of red knots and horseshoe crabs in the objective statement is not recommended. The second part of the objective function was to evaluate this two, two times multiplier on the utility of female crab harvest that we have in the reward function. This was put into the ARM framework to reflect uh, the market value with females being uh, twice as valuable as males. Uh, we considered whether this multiplier should be part of the objective function and is it still accurate and our conclusion is that it is accurate and so our re recommendation is that because the multiplier of utility of female crab harvest in the reward function reflects market value, uh, it's recommended that it is left in the model. The third part of the objective function involved this uh, sex ratio constraint on the utility of male crabs. Uh, this is an, a an aspect of the objective function that actually was, is redundant with part of our population dynamics model uh, for horseshoe crabs. And, re and so and re we evaluated removing it and it resulted in only minor changes to the output of the model. And so given its redundancy, our re recommendation is that we remove the sex ratio constraint because it's conceptually redundant with aspects of the horseshoe crab population dynamics model. And then finally, uh, with re revisiting the objective function, we evaluated the utility functions for female harvest and their shape. Currently, we have a knife-edged uh, step function for utility, and we evaluated um, an alternative, which is a sloped utility function. Uh, we reviewed some simulation work by Smith et al. and found that the slope function did not demonstrate a significant difference than the current knife edge function. There was very little change in uh, population trajectories and no biological reasoning for changing the utility function here. So our recommendation is given the lack of change between the two approaches and a, a lack of reasons to change the current approach, we recommend no change from the current uh, knife edge function. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Kirby. For... So uh, just for the board's clarity on the preferred option that the ARM subcommittee put forward for including biomedical mortality into the ARM framework, this would result in needing an, a new addendum to the FMP. Uh, and so what I have on this slide is just a breakdown of how that would proceed. So if the board were to go forward with, uh, best way to look at it would be two, two prongs, the recommendation of the arms, the recommendations of the arms subcommittee and wanting to go with the preferred option, then leaving this meeting, they would, uh, we would have to have uh, an addendum initiated, uh, at which point staff would go back, work on this, likely with uh, the arms subcommittee uh, and the technical committee, pull together that document, 
bring it before the board, likely via conference call um, at some point either at the end of August or the beginning of September, and then uh, the board would need to approve that document to go out to public comment uh, so that there would be a 30-day public comment period where there would be public hearings. Um, uh, the AP, the TC would be able to chime in again, and then the board would consider the document uh, for final approval at the annual meeting uh, in October. So that's just one way that this would go forward uh, if the board's preference is to include biomedical mortality with the uh, with the preferred option the armed subcommittee put forward. Um, and the other thing to just note is that the armed subcommittee uh, is able to make all these other recommended changes to uh, the arm model uh, for the 2017 uh, fishing year. So our normal specification process uh, is still uh, um, we're keeping that timetable, so at the uh, annual meeting, the, the board would consider 2017 harvest specs, uh, either with options that come out of that addendum or uh, kind of a status quo, quo approach. So uh, just to clarify the, for the board at this point. So if there are any questions or comments specifically on the ARM framework recommendations that the subcommittees put forward, um, if not, we can move on to the technical committee's report and then the AP's report, so whatever is the pleasure of the board. Michael Luizzi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I. W I'm interested in the harvest package statement that was made um, during the presentation regarding the consideration for harvest packages that include uh, some female harvest in the bait, you know, in the bait industry. And this board tasked the work of the ARM subcommittee to evaluate that and put forth to the board um, options for consideration, potential consideration on small levels of female harvest to help revitalize some of what the bait industry has lost. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your comments uh, regarding why by can taking, taking that one step further and perhaps including that in an addendum, why would we essentially be wasting, it sounded like to me like we'd be wasting our time and that we'd, we would still find ourselves in the position only to have one option to select from uh, when we're talking about the army, to talking about the packages that have been selected over the last few years. I don't know if you can just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, it's just so for the board's clarity, again, back in, uh, I believe it was November when we first started talking about this, uh, uh, we heard from the board an interest in having female harvest options uh, outside of what is already in the addendum. So the ARM subcommittee went back, looked at uh, a number of possibilities. ARM subcommittee members drew up a bunch of options, which are included in the report. They're in the appendix. Um, but the bottom line was that even if you wanted to add in these additional harvest packages, the thresholds that are set up in the, the, the ARM model currently need to uh, be exceeded in terms of increasing the population above them in order for any uh, package to be selected that uh, is um, it includes female harvest. So that's why we are currently still at that 500 male crab uh, preferred pop package. And so without any changes to that abundance estimate, then even adding a bunch more harvest packages wouldn't necessarily move the needle to select them. Follow up, Mike? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, okay, I get it. So uh, just another question. Um, when would be the next time that we might get a, get a peak at abundance? And then how were the, the thresholds ultimately established? Were they, were they based, on, um, based on the assessment, or were they just selected as, as, a, as a number of horseshoe crabs that we ultimately want in the population? So I'll answer the process issue or question, and then I'll turn it over to Jim Lyons to talk about the threshold. So the process would be, you know, this is this um, initial setup phase revisiting that we're doing right now. Um, if the board were to move forward with the recommendations of the ARM subcommittee, the next time would be four to six years from now, kind of the same timetable that was laid out in Addendum uh, 7. So four to six years from now, that's when it would be revisited. 
Yeah, and, and with respect to how these thresholds were developed, they, these were created during the setup phase that I mentioned and um, were developed in stakeholder meetings. Uh, there were several meetings back in the early years to identify these utility thresholds and set them, these population thresholds. Uh, and I believe the number, the current figure is 80% um, of estimated carrying capacity and there was some literature and some research on estimating carrying capacity and the, the stakeholder meetings chose, uh, chose that threshold. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it appears that Any accommodation for biomedical mortality will result in a decrease in the, uh, the present 500,000 male crab harvest scenario. A am I correct in that assumption? In other words, if biomedical mortality is incorporated into the ARM model, that 500,000 number of male crabs is going to decrease. Am I right? Yeah, let me um, try to address this question. Yes, the um, biomedical, as the, the bait harvest, uh, the allocation to bait harvest is reduced as biomedical is incorporated under the uh, preferred option. Um, the important thing to point out is that under the preferred option, we've changed the packages very minimally. And so the, um, if the, population stay the same, the, func the ARM framework should continue to operate as it currently is right now. With the minority option, we actually, we don't change the packages and the uh, implicit allocation to bait harvest remains the same, but in changing the population dynamics model the way that we will under the minority option, you actually have a greater harvest, a greater total harvest and so a greater subtraction after natural mortality. And that has the potential to lead to more conservative uh, packages. We don't, we don't have any simulations or um, any evidence of that, um, but I say that simply out of first principles and, and a population dynamics model. If you're subtracting more uh, harvest mortality, um, it seems reasonable to... Uh, think it, there's the potential to move to more conservative packages from, say, 500,000 males only to package two or even package one. If I may follow up, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Roy. Is there any compelling evidence that the present harvest rates are constraining the population recovery of horseshoe crabs? In other words, uh, it seems to me if we're going to contemplate reducing say the 500,000 male only horseshoe crab harvest, we would have to have compelling evidence uh, that in fact that given level of, of harvest today is still constraining the recovery of this population. Is there evidence to that effect? Uh, so I'll take a stab at this and then maybe turn it over to either Jim or our technical committee uh, staff to, to provide further comment. Um, you know, so we are still operating in without a stock assessment to give us a, you know, a stock status for the Delaware Bay region. So when we're looking at the ARM framework, you know, we're not considering the stock assessment right now. We're just, the our, our data inputs are the Virginia Tech Trawl Survey, and in the absence of that, we have the composite index. Um, we have information on harvest rates over the last few years, and in last year in particular, on, on the regional level, uh, the Delaware Bay region states uh, had uh, lower bait harvest than they had in previous years, but there are a couple of factors that may be contributing to that um, in terms of uh, uh, stockpiling some crabs carrying over from one year to the next. Uh, so there's a couple of factors that may be influencing that pop the Delaware Bay population um, currently, but we don't have a overall indicator of how the population is doing. Well, I uh, might just add that the um, 
the, pop, the population monitoring that we have for crabs suggests maybe a stable or slightly increasing population. And so it may be that over time uh, pop, the population will continue to grow and then we would have, um, that, and then it's likely that the ARM framework recommendation would change. But our evidence right now is that the smartest thing to do given the objectives that we have and the monitoring information that we have is is this five has has been the 500,000 crabs Randy Muffley Thanks Mr. Chairman I have a couple questions one a, a hopefully easy question Jim you had presented in the uh, in the index the the composite index that you all created, the, the indices that you use in that index, and you talk about the New Jersey Delaware Bay Trawl Survey, and up on the slide you had indicated the our uh, surf clam dredge survey that we use. But in the memo it says it, our New Jersey Ocean Trawl Survey is used in that index. So I was just looking to see what indices are actually used mostly because uh, funding for one of them is more subject than the other one. So if we're relying on the surf clam survey, which is more variable in terms of funding uh, versus our ocean trawl. So I just wanted to clarify which surveys are actually used for the composite index first. Yeah, I believe it's the ocean trawl and not the dredge. So um, there, must, there was a misprint there somewhere. Okay, thank you. And then on these sort of harvest packages, can you give me a little bit more information in terms of you said that if if we allocate uh, under these harvest packages some harvest to the biomedical industry how we are not we're not putting a limit on that biomedical industry although we're assigning a specific quota it seems like to them so I'm trying to understand how that how we're not impacting the biomedical industry harvest by actually having a quota assigned to them and how are we giving under option three some mortality assigned to females when the option is for a 500,000 male only harvest? So two questions on that. Okay. Um, uh, what was? Okay. Yeah. About whether it's a cap or not and then uh, having females. Okay, thank you. It's, um, the reason I say it's, uh, it's not a cap is that we're actually, the, the harvest packages, the new harvest packages are created from the biomedical data. And so what we're doing is, is simply accounting for the known mortality that we have from uh, the biomedical industry. And so every, periodically we, we create this running average and then we add those, um, add that mortality to uh, the current packages. And so I say it's not a cap because we're not, it's not necessarily, this is a limit, this is only what you can take. It is acknowledging what has been uh, taken and the harvest that has been going on. And for it to be, with the current set of packages, I should add that it, um, for it to be considered a cap, the biomedical harvest, the biomedical mortality would have to increase by an order of magnitude. Uh, and there are, uh, are in, with a small amount of time, we can come up with the numbers of crabs that would have to be bled before we would exceed the total package and all of it going to biomedical. But it's an order of magnitude increase in the biomedical that would, um, that would, that would be required before this would actually be any kind of cap or limit. Um, and I've forgotten the second part of your question. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? It was just how, how are we allowing for mortality to females under, a, under the one scenario, which was a 500,000 male-only harvest, and you're allocating some of that mortality to females. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the one thing to, that we should point out with this preferred option is that it does create this allocation decision for the board. And those packages list a certain amount of female harvest, but the board would uh, designate that that is female harvest for the biomedical industry only. And if we were to look at the table, you would see that the allocation debate would be zero females. So the female harvest in the new packages is for biomedical only. Robert Riley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, you know, I've been concentrating as I went through the materials on how challenging it's going to be and has been for an index of abundance. And I guess I'm wondering two things. One, for the composite index, um, when the trawl survey was not available and using other surveys and going through a correlation and regression and uh, a number of, of sort of permutations there, what kind of rigorous review has that methodology received? That's, that's one question. And the second question is tied in. Um, it indicates that the efficiency of the trawl survey um, was looked at in 2011 and certainly was not 100 percent. And so the composite index also suffers from underestimation of abundance. And I'm just wondering, has that been addressed in any way, or is that something that still just is left unknown? I will, um, I will take a stab at this. The, the composite index in that work was, um, was done by, the, by our subcommittee um, in response to the the, the um, lack of funding for the trial survey, and so we rather I think we did go with the status quo for one year, but then we tried to develop a um, an alternative approach based on other surveys, um, and we uh, produced this this approach and I believe presented it to the board, but that um, as far as I know has not gone has not undergone a peer review process beyond the subcommittee. Um, and with respect to the efficiency of the trial survey, um, yeah, the subcommittee recognizes it's not 100 percent and that if we understood um, the catchability of that survey better, that would be an improvement to the, um, to the monitoring program. All right, Rob, make it quick because uh, we've got two more presentations to go through and getting run out of time. Quick as lightning, Mr. Chairman. So the question is, is that something that will be looked at this year, the catchability? Will that be further addressed? Yeah, we, we asked um, uh, Eric Hallerman to consider this, the gear selectivity in doing uh, hit the survey this fall, uh, so that these recommendations were made known to Eric Hallerman, and he's receptive to conducting this study in the fall. Okay, I have Stu Michaels, and then I got Mike Millard, and then we're going to move on. Stu? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks very much, Jim. This is a lot of work by the committee, and it's certainly appreciated by this board. But can you help me understand this biomedical mortality component um, a little bit better? I don't, under, I don't quite understand how it's not, how it shouldn't be additive instead of incorporating it into the overall mortality and, and essentially spitting out a quota, quasi-quota, for the biomedical uh, fishery. I, was there any consideration that, that we just consider this biomedical um, aspect as additive, incorporated into the model? I guess kind of the, the um, what's it called, the, the secondary option? and then just treat it as an additive component to mortality and, and is not apportioned in any, any further manner? Um, yeah, let me, I'll take a stab at it, Stu, and, and Kristen can perhaps help. Um, yeah, the, it, it is, I mean, I, I think what you're describing is close to the minority option. It is additive in that sense that, I mean, it's a little more clear that it's additive there under the minority option. But there is a feedback from the harvest recommendation to the population dynamics model in all cases. And so even with the majority opinion, the new packages and the total mortality associated with them is additive to natural mortality. And so because there's feedback in all cases between what we recommend for harvest and the population dynamics, the two, the two approaches are similar in that way. It's the amount of change in the packages and the actual um, total harvest that results that's different. 
Okay, Stu, go. Thank you. Uh, but you also contend that the, the change is so slight, right, that the, the biomedical portion is so slight that it, it really wouldn't, it would take a, basically a doubling of the amount of biomedical harvest to really make a difference? Is that, I, is that what I understood that you said earlier? Maybe I with with respect to the cap part. Yeah. No, that it was. It's more, much more than doubling. The the biomedical mortality would have to increase by an order of magnitude, ten times what it is now, before the whole harvest record package would be um, allocated to biomedical. Mike Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try and be quick. I did want to circle back to Roy's question about the, the inevitability of, of a reduction to the bait harvesters under either of these options. Um, if, and I'm going to ask, I guess, Jim, if, tell me if I have this right. Under the preferred option, uh, the model remains ignorant of, of the biomed harvest, and that adjustment is made after the model gives us its answer. And that's clearly a reduction to the, to the bait harvesters. Under the minority option, then the biomed mortality is added into the front of the model. The model now sees more mortality uh, and goes through its optimization routine. And as you said, that compounds and ends up in a larger uh, mortality seen at the end of the run and gives us the chance of it picking a more conservative harvest package. Now I know, and, and it's, Dr. Smith's simulations weren't exactly designed to get at this question, but he did run simulations with this model package to see how it behaves, how it performs. And in his simulations, the, the package or the, the model optimization scheme never picked, never landed on option two. It always went from three to one, which is total moratorium. So uh, I guess I'm asking you, if we were to do the minority option, you cannot discount that we would land on package number one. Uh, that's a possibility if, if we go down that road, it seems to me. Total moratorium. Right, right. Yeah, I, th um, I would agree. With, yeah, with your assessment, Mike. I think uh, everything you've said there is correct. And because of the way the minority option is implemented, and the tendency of the optimization routine when it's seeking a more conservative uh, recommendation, tends to skip over package two and select package one at times when reducing harvest is. Um, this, the uh, prefer or the optimal solution, um, and so yeah, I, I think it's uh, accurate to say without um, without knowing the answer right now that just on first principles of this modeling approach, uh, when you have total a greater total mortality, there's a greater chance that you would end up with a more conservative package, and in this case, um, perhaps a moratorium. A quick follow up, if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So, uh, thank you, Jim. And if it doesn't change, if it still lands on package number three, then we are left right where we are now. We have the same harvest package, the bait people get it all, and with a known up to 10% removal by the biomedical people that, again, is essentially ignored or not accounted for by us, it seems to me, under that minority option. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to go on to uh, Steve Dock, who's going to give us a, a report from the Technical Committee. Steve? Hi, I'm Steve Doctor from the Maryland Fisheries Service, and um, today I'll be acting in the capacity as the chairman of the Horseshoe Crab Technical Committee and also representing the Delaware Bay Ecosystem Technical Committee. So um, the Technical Committee was... Um, given this information just as you have, and um, we've come up with some recommendations. You have to advance this one page down. Okay, so the, um, we met by conference call on July 28th. The AFCNOC staff presented the ARM subcommittee review and recommendations. 
um, evaluated the subcommittee recommendations and considered the biomedical mortality estimate inclusion and um, discussed on um, biomedical mortality threshold exceedance, which is another word for um, the, the standards for the biomedical companies. Um, the technical committee was in agreement that the ARM subcommittee review is acceptable. Some of the comments that came from the committee were further exploration of alternative harvest packages with the har female harvest. There was kind of disappointment that that wasn't um, pursued further. And um, they also had a recommendation that further work be done to reconcile the red knot mark recapture abundance estimate with the aerial estimate. There seems to be um, some things that need to be worked out between those two. Um, as far as including the biomedical mortality and the ARM fa uh, framework, both technical committees agree that the ARM framework to be properly run should incorporate biomedical mortality. A majority of both technical committees were in favor of the ARM subcommittee's preferred option. The reason cited that by using an average it does not violate confidentiality rules. It's transparent and explicit of mortality estimates and then treats harvest types similarly as removals. There was also minority support for the ARM subcommittee's secondary opinion. The reason cited that um, it accounts for biomedical mortality without changing harvest packages would not require an addendum and is a transparent inclusion in the ARM framework. Biomedical mortality in the ARM framework continued. Um, if the addendum is developed, uh, sensitivity analysis should be done to see how both options would be implemented. That means like we're discussing um, that if you did the method where the mortality was taken out of the model, it would be nice to do some sensitivity analysis to see actually if it would choose one, two, three, or four, whether that would actually change because, I mean, the mortality has already been experienced and we would like to see if it changes the reaction of the model and then also um, you know the, try the addendum try the preferred alternative too to see if it would change on um, the outputs um, also there's a uh, and the option four that's presented the preferred alternative they have um, recommendations on the amount of female and male removals um, because this process is going to happen every four years and there's growth in the biomedical industry, it was a recommendation that there be a buffer, maybe 10, 20 percent on the amount that's um, given to the biomedical industry for growth so that we wouldn't, you know, maybe hit a trigger that, that over, overruns the biomedical allocation. And then there was also some confusion over jurisdiction and the ability of the board to limit biomedical harvest. Both technical committees requested that the board determine jurisdiction for possibility of limiting biomedical collection and harvest. And then the biomedical threshold exceedance recommendations were basically uh, recommendations for um, the biomedical industry. And um, some of the technical committee members requested requiring biomedical companies to contribute to funding to the Virginia Tech Trial Survey and other studies of biomedical mortality. Um, there was not a lot of public support for the ARM model. And I think that's all I've got. Any questions? Questions for Steve? Oh, good. We'll move right along then. We're going to go to the, <laughs> the uh, advisory panel report. From Just give us a second here to get set up. Jim Cooper is going to give us a report from the advisory panel. Jim? Yes, the advisory panel uh, received the discussions of uh, the ARM proposals, as you've just uh, heard, and I won't uh, elaborate on that. Uh, in, in going directly to the advisory panel uh, report, uh, let's go to the comments uh, for the panel that began on the bottom page one where uh, we point out that uh, the uh, AP members uh, were not in favor of the ARM proposal to include any uh, biomedical or mortality. We felt that this was uh, 
uh, inadequately supported at this time and perhaps premature. We were only given 10 days to even uh, to study this uh, uh, matter. And some of the uh, problems that uh, they did have, uh, that started with the fact that uh, the preferred option would uh, potentially bring the bait and biomedical uh, harvest, um, excuse me, uh, industries in conflict with one another. And actually, we, we don't think that's in the best interest of everyone. Uh, obviously, we're very different industries, but we'd rather try to accommodate each other uh, whenever uh, possible. <coughs> The mortality estimates from bleeding uh, we think are, are insignificant with respect uh, to bait fishery uh, harvestry. In fact, we think uh, uh, really insignificant with respect to the number of uh, horseshoe crabs that are uh, in the ocean. Uh, in, so that including the ARM models would actually, uh, we think, also go against the intention of the ARM framework uh, as uh, previously identified. There was concern that neither of the uh, options have been tested through uh, simulations and perhaps uh, premature for the board to uh, consider at this time. And also we're concerned that uh, the biomedical data being introduced at this point would be the first step in creating uh, limit limits to collecting horseshoe crabs for the biomedical production of LEL uh, reagent. We think that limiting uh, LEL would have a significant impacts uh, certainly on the uh, biomedical uh, community and I will uh, point out a little bit later that the, the FDA of course has uh, no impact in this area other than to require biomed companies to return uh, them to the, uh, to the sea. They have nothing to do with collection. However, uh, they'll be very interested should there be any threat to the availability of reagent uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the industry. And we feel like uh, we weren't uh, given much uh, time and also the fact that uh, these uh, committees, once they got around to biomedical uh, discussions, uh, would have benefited from the presence of a biomedical uh, expert uh, to help them deal with uh, some issues, misinformation, and uh, things like that. And uh, we certainly were uh, felt that we had not uh, been consulted by a su subcommittee in the development of these uh, options. So the AP did indeed take exception to most of the um, ARM recommendations. Uh, we feel that uh, this could be revisited over the uh, next uh, two years. And uh, I'll take questions at this point. I don't want to belabor this issue. Time's running short. Do we have any questions for, for Jim Cooper? Oh, okay, seeing none, um, I think what we're going to try to do is um, maybe break this into two pieces. We have... Um, we essentially need a motion uh, to adopt some of these recommendations. However, the, including the biomedical package seems to be the one that's going to get a lot more discussion. So uh, if it's a pleasure of the board, if we could somebody put up a motion actually for the other points, whatever, would be helpful to move this along. Hmm. Well, the other option is we put this all in one package one way or the other and we could get bogged down. So, um, Brandon? Well, following that vein, not the latest, putting it all together, I agree, let's try to separate it out. So, move to approve all ARM subcommittee and technical committee recommendations except for the biomedical harvest subcommittee packages. I have a second from Robert Boyles. Do we have discussion on the motion? Seeing none, is there any public comment on the motion?
Jim, do you want to comment on the uh, the, the other four pieces of it? Or do you want to? No. No. She doesn't want to comment. Okay. All right. So, seeing none from the from the public, Michael Easy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was prepared to take a little a little bit of a different approach and also include in this addendum um, some analysis on the on the alternative harvest packages, which include female harvest as far as as part of the bait industry. Um, Going back to what um, Brandon said earlier about the harvest package as it's selected now with 500 male crabs and then the allowance of female harvest at, at the biomedical facilities, I, I th just think it's a difficult explanation to make as to why a small level of 25,000 to 30,000 crab harvest can't happen. I don't understand why it can't, and I can't explain it to my public who have asked me to, to support them and asked our commission to support them on their interests. So um, while I absolutely agree that this, that this biomedical industry issue on, um, on mortality needs to go out to the public and we need to get feedback. Um, but I'd like to incorporate another piece to this. So if I may, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion to substitute. Go ahead, Mike. It moved to initiate an addendum to the Horseshoe Crab Fishery Management Plan to address the Adaptive Resources Management Subcommittee's recommendations to the ARM framework regarding one, mortality associated with the biomedical industry, and two, bait harvest packages which allow female horseshoe crab harvest as presented in Appendix C of the framework review. I sent it to Kirby. Okay. Can but I, I just borrow your laptop for a minute? Because yeah. I can't. Um, yeah, that's right there. While we're getting up there, is any, uh, do we have a second to this motion? Or do you want to see it first? <laughs> mm -hmm. Craig, are you second in the motion? Okay. Do you, um, we got questions on the, or comments, discussion on the motion? Mike, you want to take a first comment, uh, crack at this? Sure, I'll just, uh, I'll, st I'll say, and I've said it before, you know, these are, these are the two big issues that came out of the ARM recommend, out of the, out of the subcommittee's recommendations, and I absolutely appreciate all the hard work and effort that goes, goes into those recommendations, and the work that's happened since last year, um, you know, I've been getting feedback from staff, and, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work, and I, and I, and I do appreciate it. However, I think there needs to be more public involvement in the understanding and the decision making that happens as a result of these two issues. And I feel that the addendum process through, through the commission is just that process. And that by us selecting here today, one of those re the recommendations we had, we heard a minority and a majority um, opinion on the biomedical industry. Uh, we also heard that with the female harvest packages in the bait industry, that it is very likely that the model will select whatever the, the current package. But I'd like to see what would happen as a result of running the model through those, through those different options and then be able to make the decision at the end of the day as to the path we take. I think it, it brings the two big issues that we've been talking about um, for years to the table and it brings it to the board so that we can ultimately make those those policy decisions and that's the purpose for me uh, moving forward in this direction. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Other questions or comments? Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, clearly, South Carolina's got strong interest in, in horseshoe crabs um, and even horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay region. I just wanted to point out that uh, you know, we had an opportunity to brief our board 
couple of weeks ago about this fishery, the unique fishery that we've got in South Carolina. And um, thanks to some good work by a number of our forebears, I think we've got a, a really good program in South Carolina. And I recall that um, some time ago there was conversations about, well, maybe some options would include let's turn every crab that's bled into bait. Um, and I think we've, uh, I made some comments, some strong comments against that at the time because that's con not consistent with the way we manage this fishery in South Carolina. Um, I was talking to my colleague from New Jersey about, you know, their fishery. And I would just, you know, for the board's, um, or for my edification, for the board to know that, you know, we've, we do get good data um, from industry on uh, reported mortality. Uh, we think it's a well-managed fishery. We think it's very, very important. Um, uh, and, and we place a high value on that biomedical fishery to the extent that we don't allow horseshoe crabs to be used for bait. So I just wanted to uh, you know, make those comments for the benefit of the board as we move into this discussion and try to sort out how do we best uh, manage this fishery. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Dan McKernan? Yeah, I'd be more comfortable with this motion if... I had a law enforcement uh, representative telling me that opening the female harvest was something they could control effectively. Other comments? Do we have uh, any, any comments from the public on this? No. Nope. Okay, seeing none, um, I'll give you a minute to, oh, Brandon. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. I I'm still struggling with it from from the biomedical industry, not even to my friend over in Maryland's perspective. I'm interested in evaluating what their options may be for a female horseshoe crab harvest. I'm still struggling whether or not we really need. I support that we, I think we need to account for the biomedical industry mortality so that we have a complete picture of what's going on. I don't think it's that significant, but I think we need to account for it. And I think we can do that with the alternative option that was presented that would not require uh, us to go out to an addendum to evaluate that. You know, when we talk about increasing in mortality, you know, when you're showing an increasing mortality, we may result in more restrictive measures. That may be, but when you're accounting for, now you're accounting for new mortality, which isn't necessarily new, but it's new in terms of accounting for through the modeling process. What may also happen is to show if we're showing increasing trends in, to some regards in the Delaware Bay population, this mortality is already taking place. So what may happen by accounting for, you just may scale up the amount of horseshoe crabs that are available in the population. So it may not be a negative uh, response to the bait industry by accounting for this mortality. We don't know what the response is going to be just yet. But again, I'm still apprehensive to go down that road of assigning quotas to the biomedical industry and reducing it on the bait side of things where I think we can account for the mortality on the alternative package, which would not require an addendum. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just, Brandon, I, I didn't intend in this motion to change from what I read your motion to be. I believe that what we would end up with here are alternatives in the addendum that would expand upon the work that's been done by the subcommittee and, and give the public that information. If, if what I heard um, from Mike earlier indicated that by selecting the minority opinion, we could potentially find ourselves at a moratorium, I think that information needs to be well, well vetted. Um, so I would think, I would expect that by going forward with with the um, amended motion that we'd be looking at both opinions as well as the additional eight packages, just as a further ex expansion from what we've already heard from the subcommittee. Robert Riley. So I I, uh, I also think that the mortality from the biomedical can be accounted for in the alternative approach. And I heard Steve Doctor representing both technical committees indicating that a sensitivity analysis or something along those lines could be done to see um, what happens with these two alternatives. And I don't think anyone wants to 
just come to another meeting and find out, well, the conservative nature of the model ended up on package one. I think that that needs to be short-circuited, and we need to know about that. But uh, all in all, I expect, based on the comments uh, earlier, that this is a small amount of mortality relative to the whole stock. So, um, you know, I, too, think the, the second alternative is probably the way to look at this, get it in the model itself, and, and go from there. Thanks, Rob. Any other comments? Demerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in revealing the, the main motion and, and the substitute motion, I'm not clear what the main motion really, uh, what we'll be approving in, in the main motion. Um, it says to approve all adaptive resource management and sub, uh, subcommittee and technical committee recommendations except for biomedical. What, were, what are all the other recommendations? Well, they were the ones that were gone over in the, the first report. There was uh, five of them, whatever. So essentially what we're going to do is try to approve the four and handle the biomedical issue separately. Um, I think Mike's now has combined them back together, and that might be a better, better solution to it. So um, those earlier uh, pieces, I think, are well, would be part of this process. Are there any other questions before we uh, caucus? Okay. Uh, do, do we need a minute to caucus? All right. Take a minute and we'll call the question. That's just to make that clear. All right. The meat is running and Tony's giving me the high sign, so... All those in favor of the motion, uh, well, well, first off, remember, this is a, a motion to amend, so first we have to vote this one up, and then we'll uh, put it up as the main motion. So all those in favor of the motion to amend, please raise your hand. Extensions. Motion passes uh, 10 to 5, to 0 to 0. So this becomes the main motion now. Um, are there any comments on this from the from the board before we, we vote? Okay, anything from the public? Okay, we'll take a, some brief public comments on this. Benji, you want to go to the public mic? We'll do Chief Cooper go. first. Yeah. Oh. Benji, well, I'm going to let Jim Cooper go first. Uh, Jim um, is, is the AP chair, but he actually wants to make some comments not as the AP chair, which you would normally go back to the public mic, but because it's so far away, we're going to let him do it from here. So this is uh, individual comments from Jim. I think you have a document that has my comments, and it's misleading in the sense that I signed it off as chair of the AP, but these comments are not representative of AP comment, although mo many would uh, ag agree with me. I did uh, want to uh, try to cut this as much as I can. I think the ARM proposal starts out r by reminding everyone that uh, about two 10, uh, 2011 or 2010, the threshold, so-called mortality threshold, was exceeded, and the board was supposed to do something, and it uh, suggests that nothing was done, and that actually is not true. In 2011, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the board asked that the uh, commission enable a study of best management practices to try to uh, harmonize the way that uh, crabs are protected uh, in the biomedical uh, facilities and recognizing that the FDA's good manufacturing uh, 
practices really dominate what goes on in our uh, uh, industry, we thought, well, we'll set up procedures that uh, mimic that uh, and help us uh, with our training of, of uh, watermen, training of uh, handlers, and, uh, of course, um, writing appropriate procedures to uh, protect protect the crabs would be a, a good way uh, to do that. And uh, this was accepted by the, the board and not any other action was taken. Danielle uh, Brzezinski was uh, uh, running things at that time. And actually, I don't know that the board actually voted on anything at that time. In fact, I don't think no, they did. But nevertheless, in discussing some of the arm uh, issues, we think they may have been influenced by uh, misleading information. Uh, while preparing uh, the documents that we've discussed. For example, there was a, it has been discussed that there is uh, concern that the collapsing TAL uh, industry in China will eventually pressure uh, U.S. Um, uh, LAL uh, market if we have to supply them with reagent. Uh, actually, uh, I've looked at the marketing analyses, and it shows that Chinese firms do less than 20 percent of the world's endotoxins tests. Therefore, we could absorb that should it be uh, necessary. And in considering uh, the growth of endotoxin testing, uh, there's only modest increases anticipated over uh, the next uh, few years. Now, what happened in the first decade, uh, is the previous decade, was that there was a big increase that occurred because FDA suddenly required uh, the, the drug industry to greatly expand uh, testing of in-process samples and starting materials to make sure that they never got to the final product uh, with any potential uh, uh, contamination. So you see, this was FDA's regulatory expectation that caused a jump in LAL consumption at that time, but it's pretty much leveled off uh, now. And um, indeed, uh, uh, the FDA would react to anything that looked like a curtailment of of uh, the reagent. Uh, there's also the notion that LAL can be immediately replaced uh, by a recombinant product. And that's not true. The uh, R factor C only contains one of the enzymes as part of this uh, uh, system. The LAL reagent has a three enzyme uh, reagent. So it is certainly more uh, robust. But the big issue is that uh, using the recombinant would require expensive fluorescent uh, readers rather than the standard inexpensive light readers. Uh, so uh, that's a cost issue that would profoundly uh, limit uh, this uh, matter. And I'm sure there are uh, other uh, issues that might have come up like this. And I think the presence of a biomedical expert at the time of these discussions uh, could have avoided uh, some of these things. Now, uh, interest in uh, biomedical uh, research regarding post-release uh, mortality, uh, we, we've been discussing this to some extent uh, even today. Now, mortality estimates in the biomed industry is really difficult to study because horseshoe crabs aren't laboratory animals. They're arthropods. And it's really almost impossible to adequately reproduce uh, post-release environments for these kinds of studies, and that's the reasons we see uh, publications with uh, uh, suggesting that the post-release mortality may may be may be very high, uh, 30 or 40 percent. And it's the inability to study these in a laboratory situation that uh, brings about these kinds of uh, over uh, estimates. And I'd like to remind you that horseshoe crabs are are hardy; they've survived for millions of years, and they're resilient. Uh, I was uh, associated with Travanol Laboratories about 40 years ago, and they maintained a big tank of horseshoe crabs in order to study their coagulation systems. And one night, salt water leaked from the tank. They filled it up with tap water, you know, just fresh water. And the next morning, the staff found uh, 50 or so horseshoe crabs floating lifelessly on top of the water. They picked them up and carted them off to the disposal area, uh, very reluctantly, all despondently. And then the following Monday morning, they get a call and says, would you come down here and pick up these crabs? They're crawling all over uh, the place. So this is just a story that helps you understand that the crabs are resilient enough to even recover.
recover from a uh, freshwater uh, shock that made all of them uh, uh, look dead. So, you know, this exemplifies the uncertainty of trying to uh, reproduce a return to sea uh, environment. Uh, elegant uh, research uh, continues in uh, South Carolina. DNR scientists there have uh, been doing some elegant uh, studies on the diversity, uh, genetic diversity of uh, the crabs uh, in that state. And their study concluded that genetic diversity was high. There was little to no evidence of inbreeding, uh, evidence of a huge population offshore. She couldn't tell how big it was, but it is very, very large. It's certainly a positive indicator for uh, adaptive uh, potential. And this is Walsh and so forth. The fellows from uh, South Carolina can tell you how to access that document. Summarized, Jim. We're running out of time. So, uh, by the way, a marketing specialist uh, told me that there are approximately 60 million endotoxin tests uh, done annually. And if we assume a loss of 60,000 uh, crabs, uh, that means that we're getting about 1,000 tests for uh, each crab that might be uh, lost. And I think this is a tremendous uh, bargain. So uh, loss of a small proportion to the biomedical industry really is inconsequential and uh, justified by immense value of the reagent. So if the board uh, members uh, believe that uh, local marine resources are properly managing uh, biomedical firms and that the BMP document minimizes harm uh, to the crabs and that there's no value added to creating a third level of bureaucracy, and certainly one that leads to uh, limiting uh, the horseshoe crabs in the biomedical area. Uh, then, uh, and of course, that the we think that the exp expenditures could be used uh, more widely uh, rather than pay for an addendum. We could probably buy, pay for a uh, Virginia trawl, uh, Virginia Tech uh, trawl. So I strongly urge the board to categorically reject the proposal. Uh, armed arms document that uh, with respect to the biomedical uh, community. I think we could take a two-year moratorium on this issue and allow us to update the BMP document, continue review and research to better understand post-release mortality, and uh, hopefully have a better working relationship with any technical committee or whatever that would be uh, considering biomedical issues. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. We've got uh, Benji and Dr. Schuster. Benji, you want Dr. Schuster to go first? Is that okay? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. We're really running light, uh, short on time. Mr. Chair, thank you. I received a telephone call last night alerting me to the fact that uh, I might be interested in attending <laughs> this session, uh, primarily because there was some concern about lumping together bait and LAL resources or mortalities. True that uh, bait is 100% mortality and LAL, as Dr. Cooper has explained, is not as well understood. For this reason, I would not lump the two together, but actually, if you wanted to learn something more scientifically, I would learn more about the reproductive system of the female horseshoe crab. As far as I know, there's no one today who knows much about the functional anatomy of the crab, the physiological aspects, uh, and if you were going to form a baseline against which to compare what you are observing in experiments today on uh, the impact of bleeding on horseshoe crabs, you would certainly want to know something about the physiology of the normal, the natural horseshoe crab female. Uh, that's lacking. So if I were going to do this thing, I would think in terms basically about the biology of reproduction in the females. The second point I have, which is outlined here, is that uh, hearing that bait and LA were going to be lumped together, I thought, well, I could think about many other ways that you could lump things together. And certainly, if you do that, you can come up with a partial list as I have, and there's many more things that should be added that indicate 
the scope of the mortalities that we're dealing with in understanding the horseshoe crab. And so I went through and listed them, and then I drew a line and ascribed certain numbers to them. And uh, if I'm anywhere near the ballpark, the loss of horseshoe crabs from both LAL and bait would be less than probably 2% of the total population. If uh, you expanded that to 10%, you'd lose uh, 2.68 million crabs, and uh, that doesn't seem like an overly heavily impact upon the population since uh, uh, that occurs sometimes in some of the natural phenomena where uh, crabs are destroyed. So uh, that, I think, uh, summarizes in effect uh, the scope of what I've been thinking just thought about in that short period from last night to now, and uh, my recommendation that uh, you s have someone who seriously looks at the ecosystem approach to horseshoe crabs and uh, think in terms of the impact on crabs on, uh, for instance, the uh, surf clam industry, uh, things of this nature, that you're not dealing just with horseshoe crabs, you're dealing with ecosystems, and there doesn't seem to be much uh, concern about that, which I, I feel is, is probably the key to much of what you should be learning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schuster. Benji. You can talk. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to be quick. I don't know if I can do that, but um, my comments are... So Benji, you could just uh, identify yourself further. Oh, uh, Benji Swan, um, a lysate manufacturer in the state of New Jersey, and I have been since um, actually 1985. Um, adhering to the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission Interstate Horseshoe Crab Management Plan, the collection of horseshoe crabs for limulus amoebocyte lysate is monitored by state agencies in the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission, but not part of the arm harvest package. This is due to one fact. LAL is a life-saving, critical, essential, vital product for human health without any present alternative. Some suggest that a synthetic product can replace LAL. However, However, the synthetic product is not there yet, and perhaps never will be completely or at all. We cannot drive the market by constraining the biomedical companies. The market will drive itself. A perfect example is the new LAL application developed by a biomedical company that uses 1 20th of the raw lysate. Point two, biomedical collection is separate from bait harvest and should be, as it, its activities are essential to human health and pose no threat to the horseshoe crab population. On average, eight to nine horseshoe crabs out of 10 survive the process and can be found spawning years after bleeding. The Delaware Bay horseshoe crab population has remained stable, slightly increasing for years, and estimated to be 20 million horseshoe crabs. If the entire mortality of 60,000 crabs associated with biomedical use is attributed to the Delaware Bay region, the impact is 0.3%. A quote from the ARM subcommittee report July 16, 2016, refers to biomedical companies killing the horseshoe crabs. Any small mortality is unintentional and may be out of our control. I find it offensive that any member would accuse us of intentionally killing horseshoe crabs. Number three, when considering the adoption of the ARM modeling and the harvest package in 2010, the biomedical numbers were not included, and no substantial change in the biomedical numbers have occurred to warrant inclusion. The biomedical numbers reported in 2014 are similar to the numbers from the year 2010 prior to the ARM adoption. As an aside, when I prepared a table for illustration, more bio... Um, Regard the 2014 numbers regarding biomedical collection were reported incorrectly. More biomedical crabs were bled than collected. This isn't possible. This emphasizes a point that numbers are good to refer to, but sometimes logic has to prevail. Point four. 
A reason given for the inclusion in the arm is to make biomedical mortality more explicit. Right now, the biomedical numbers are explicit and listed in their own table. When I viewed the proposed arm table with biomedical mortality included, the table begs more questions than it answers. It is also misleading, giving one the impression that biomedical collection is limited. This is not the case, nor should it ever be. Another quote I read was, two stakeholders exploiting the resource, and again, I find this offensive. We are managing the horseshoe crab population to be sustainable and to prevent exploitation. Number five, comments on the proposed addition. First and foremost, the introduction contains mortality from the biomedical harvest to date hit a high of 90,440 crabs in 2012, an increase of nearly 100% since reporting began in 2004. Similar to the 2014 numbers, the 2012 numbers were erroneous as well. More crabs were bled than were collected. Okay, quickly reviewing the biomedical tables, the number of horseshoe crabs brought to the biomedical companies, row A, jumped between the years 2006 to 2007. One reason could be more males began to be used for bleeding and more males are needed to be equivalent to a female. Furthermore, this use of males may have been perpetuated by the adoption of Addendum 4 in 2006. I didn't have time to review this. Since then, biomedical numbers remained in the low 500,000s, with the exception of the years 2011 and 2012, increasing to the low 600,000s. And specifically, when I looked at the uh, recommendations and conclusions for the uh, proposed addition, number one, I disagree with for the above reasons. It should not be incorporated, biomedical numbers should not be incorporated into the arm model. Number two, since 2005, 11 years ago, confidential data is submitted detailing mortality at each stage. This information can be located within the biomedical table, line D, reported mortality of biomedical only crabs from harvest to release. Numbers three and five, years go by too fast. A three to five year review of BMPs would be sufficient. Number four, many of the companies have funded and are currently funding research to enrich the knowledge and understanding of the horseshoe crabs in the LAL product. To continually study the mortality of bled horseshoe crabs to get that perfect number that everyone will agree on will never happen. Each study has its own imperfections, but one consistent thread is found. The horseshoe crabs survivor can be assured at a high level if the horseshoe crabs are handled with care and concern. My last, uh, number six, my last point. Timing is fishy. The ARM subcommittee's task was to review the ARM model, which is specific to bait harvest. Uh, review its assumptions and utilities and its usefulness in managing and advancing the horseshoe crab population. Instead, it focused on biomedical activities and shorebird studies. The ARM subcommittee document was 47% shorebird activities and shorebird studies, 15.5 pages of 33. 32% of biomedical related, which was 10.5 pages of the 33 pages. 6% was two pages of references in the introduction. And 15% was a review of the R model in tagging, which was five pages. And combined with its arrival in the ninth hour, something is very fishy. I urge you to vote not to include or list the biomedical numbers in the ARM package and continue your good work in managing the horseshoe crab populations. I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Benji. Um, we're going to come back to Kirby um, and we're going to uh, go a little bit over the schedule first So before we call the question. So I just wanted to outline to the board, uh, I outlined earlier a timetable moving forward with an addendum that was based on the ARM subcommittee's recommendations. So uh, under this motion, I just wanted to make sure folks were aware that this addendum, 
initiated at this meeting would then likely be taken up to go out for public comment at the annual meeting and then final action would be taken on it at the February 2017 meeting. Um, in terms of the 2017 specification process, this addendum from what staff understands would, would be separate to the 2017 specification process. And then the last point is that uh, this motion outlined specifically that the second item, there's two parts to this addendum, lists uh, options that are included from the armed subcommittee's review. I just want to make clear that the first part is that also biomedical mortality in terms of the decision point there, would that be drawing from the armed subcommittee's um, review items or additional work? So those are just some points to consider and clarify uh, for staff. Mike. On your last point, Kirby, was my intention when making the motion that um, the first issue on biomedical mortality, there would be a range of alternatives to include the status quo and then the two minority and majority opinions from the arm, from the arm presentation. Tony. I just wanted to clarify, I think best case scenario is we can get you a document for review to go out for public comment at the um, meeting in October, but there's also a chance that it might not be available until February. It depends on how much work it'll entail for the TC, because don't forget they still have to pull together the ARM packages for, um, for the board approval in October. Good point. Thanks, Tony. All right, back to the board. Uh, Bill Adler. Can I make a motion to, um, to postpone till the next meeting? this whole motion. You can, but you need a second. Guess not. Motion fails for lack of a second. So back to the board. Are there any comments on the motion? Okay. Do you need uh, any time to caucus? Okay. I'll give one minute to caucus. Okay, everybody ready for the question? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All those opposed? No votes? Abstentions? Motion passes 13 to 0, 0 Thanks, everyone. We have one more order of business. 13 to what? 13 to, uh, which is on the uh, bait trials. And I think we're going to turn this over to Bob Ballou, who's going to just make this so efficient and intro it and get a motion and just get this thing going. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I am prepared to collapse the 30-minute uh, agenda item into what might be just a two- or three-minute uh, item. Of course, that depends on the board's response. But I'll just say in brief, uh, we've had some good discussion at our last few board meetings regarding alternative bait, uh, which, to clarify, involves a composite or some other variation that uses less horseshoe crabs relative to current levels while continuing to meet the needs of whelk and eel fishermen. So with a view to maintaining momentum on the issue, I'd like to suggest Moving ahead with another round of alternative bait trials involving those states uh, interested in participating, whoever they may be, but instead of trying to pull this off this fall, which I think was an initial idea, um, it now seems evident that a, a better approach would be to suggest doing this uh, next year in 2017. That would give the board time to uh, design the study, uh, really through the TC, of course, design the study, determine participation, determine costs and available funding sources, and bring the whole package back before the board for review and approval prior to implementation. And in chatting to Kirby about it, he brought up the very good point that this might actually sync well with the assessment um, uh, so that the, it would re be reported out in 2018, which is when the assessment's going to be undertaken as well. So with that, I did uh, prepare a motion to just sort of uh, uh, move forward uh, along the lines of what I just indicated, and I think staff is looking to bring that up. Again, the point being to try to move forward uh, 
um, but not to do it until 2017. The key caveat, as I think you'll see reflected, is that uh, Tony reminded me that this would need to be folded in. If the board agrees to do this, to task the TC, it would need to be folded into the action plan for next year. That's an October 2016 issue. So. Um, I would therefore, and I'll read this motion now into the record, move to task the technical committee with designing bait experiments to be completed in 2017 for those states that opt to participate involving reduced amounts of horseshoe crab relative to status quo in the whelk and eel fisheries to be developed for board review and approval by October 2016. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Second to the motion, Brandon Muffley. Discussions on the motion? Adam Nawalski. I am guessing that with this motion we have a firm commitment from at least Rhode Island to go through with those trials for dis asking the TC to design something for those states that opt to participate, I think it might be helpful to the, would it be helpful to the TC to know how many states they're looking at? I would think that would be part of the design process. So that would be the one concern I have with this, is giving them some direction here who those states might be. That's a good point, Adam. So we're assuming Rhode Island would be interested. How about by a show of hands, how many states would be, would consider the, the, this? So we got at least five states that are interested in doing this, so I think that would be a, a worthwhile endeavor. Do you agree, Adam? <laughs> it's up to the board. <laughs> well, any other questions before we vote on this motion or comments? Go ahead, Tony. And, you know, I think that the, the main reason for wanting to know the states is that that way it'll help us develop a budget a little bit better in order to include that into the action plan. Um, depending on location, et cetera, will help us devise or get information from the bait supplier and how much it would cost to get bait down to the different states. So you want to get the specific states? Um, so we'll we'll reach out in an email to determine to the full to the full board and get at least commitment that you are interested in participating so that we can develop a budget based on that. Okay, Tony, thanks. Any other comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Opposed? No votes? Abstentions. Passes unanimously. That is the last uh, item we have. Is there any other business to come before the Horseshoe Crab Board? Seeing none, I will exercise my right as a chair to adjourn us. We are adjourned. We will start Coastal Sharks Board almost immediately. The Sturgeon Board has a presenter that has a flight, so we need to keep moving as quickly as possible. Thank you.